So welcome to my talk, The Truth About Code Reviews. My name is Sebastian Greulach. I'm working at Encodo. Encodo is a small company in uh, Winterthur. And we do have a very lively review culture. We do review um, not only the code, we review all the requirements, we review the design. It is, it's involved in every step. So it's not like a process step for us, so we do it um, along the way. It's, we're doing peer reviews, um, very sy synchronous um, at the desk. So uh, the question is, uh, why do I come up with a talk about code reviews if this is working for us so well? Um, it's simple. Uh, it didn't. We, we had some problems um, how we conduct the code reviews. And uh, we had the impression we could improve really what we are doing. So, um, and there was also, we, have, we are a small team, but also we have some home office work. And all the home office uh, work was not reviewed. So we were thinking, yeah, maybe this is a, a problem. Um, <coughs> this is a process problem. And then, um, but we are not the only ones. So lately, um, there was uh, this call of IBM, which they also have problems with remote work, and they they try to forbid this. So what I was doing was um, I was going on the research, and the first thing um, you encounter when you're doing research. Um, about a certain topic, you see all the benefits. And the benefits, these are the things that really get you going. And the first and most important benefit you see there is finding defects. There's also, for a lot of people, the main motivation of starting code reviews or conducting them. 44% of, the, of the managers decide for doing code reviews because they do want to find defects. And this is only true because they were convinced by charts like this. Um, it's a chart of uh, Jason Cohen. I would say Jason Cohen is the expert for, for code reviews. He did a lot of studies, um, published a lot of papers, wrote a book, or even has now a product um, which can conduct code reviews. And here in this chart, on the left side, um, you see the amount of bugs after each phase um, done without code reviews. And on the right side, you see them done with code reviews. And then uh, the fixing cost for a bug um, is, is more expensive um, is it, if it goes nearer to production. So you can calculate this through, and you can say, okay, if I do early bug fixing, and if I can find my defects very early in the process, it's a lot cheaper. In this case, it was even half. But really, do you feel this? Do you feel this when you go to your peer? Are you looking for defects? Uh, do you go there uh, for, with the purpose of hunting bugs? I don't think so. It's only 15% of the comments we get during a review that really refer to a defect. And the defect here um, is what I call a malfunction, or really um, maybe a deviation of the requirement. So what is, it? what is it, what we really see in the reviews? 50% of the comments about maintainability. How is my method named? Can we restructure this in a better way? And this is really something I feel more to be true. This, during a code review, I really s look out for how the code is perceived from me as a, as a fellow developer. So there was another study and there was a comment about, from a developer, and he said, um, code review is the discipline of explaining my code to my peer. And when I explain my code to my peer, I really, I really get a feedback from him. And this is what I want to emphasize. I really want to get some feedback from my code. So what is the code review then, if you're not hunting bugs? It's a technical discussion. We really. We really go back and forth. We want to challenge what we did. We really want to get feedback. And this feedback is not a high-level talk, maybe during lunch or uh, at dinner over a beer, 
what we really have is we really talk about our code there where it happens, really at the problem cracking, really at the source. And this is when we see then the benefits we have there about code reviews, this makes a lot more sense. We have team awareness and transparency. So I explain my code to my peers and they exactly know how I'm working, how I approach my problems. I improve my code. It's, it's because of the maintainability of, of, of the nature. Somebody read already my code and tried to understand it. We have knowledge transfer as well. I share my stuff. Um, people, yeah, people can have a look at this. Um, they can also have a look at the details. And then, um, if, I'm, if I'm going, if I have well reviews and I conduct them very often, um, we also find alternative solutions. This is really due to this discussion. I get another point of view um, to, what, to the approach I've done. So maybe I get a better approach to my solution there. And also, yeah, this is true. We still do. We do find defects. Also, not so many, but there, that's the case is true nonetheless. But when you are uh, having a lot of benefits, there are also drawbacks. And the drawbacks are, uh, it costs developer time. The developer is a, is a valuable resource, um, and we want to keep them going. And this is also the thing about interruption. Um, when you get the developer interrupted, um, it takes for more than 30 minutes to get into the flow again where he was before the interruption. This is because you need to be highly concentrated on what you're doing, get everything together in your brain, and then this takes time to, to ramp up. And as we are not predicting, as we con cannot predict that we are really finding bugs, this is not a good quality assurance measure. It really is a quality creating measure because I rate maintainability very high when you have code. Code reviews can be done in different sizes. There are different types. Uh, 40 years ago, Michael Fagan um, was the one formalizing it uh, in a study, and then they were called code inspections, really big meetings where um, teams were going through prints out of code and checking line by line if there is a bug or not. Um, normally, this is done not, um, that isn't done anymore today, but it maybe has a valuable case as well. And then it's, it goes all the way down. It has all different sizes until um, you maybe just conduct them, um, I don't know, very, very seldom or, or very lightweight. What I want to, um, um, to see the difference here is um, what we have nowadays, a lot of tools, and how we can use them and which benefits they have. The tools we have, they certainly do work for scenarios where the people are not working in a team together. It's maybe for an open source community where there is no team. So they need a tool to somehow synchronize. And th this, is, this is a very good, good approach for them. It's asynchronous when I use a tool. That's nice because um, I get not interrupted. I can have myself um, going there and see when to conduct the review. But there's a little but. I will come to this. And this is written. When, when, I have, when I do this face to face or maybe over a phone call or a, a video share, um, or where I can share my screen, um, this can be a lot more faster. I get immediate feedback. I can ask questions. I can, can, I can answer them. So the synchronous approach is, is very fast compared to the asynchronous one. It has also benefits. If you can, I would emphasize you to do this. When we have written feedback, um, they can, be, can have different flavors. Um, when you're very attached, attached to your product um, and, and somebody is then conducting uh, reviews uh, or conducting new, new stuff to your, um, to your product, as, and then you can have very emotional reactions, like Venus uh, told us here in this example. But what the case is in written, um, with written comments is the people, they try to be sarcastic. They try to be ironic and maybe uh, also abusive. So um, this gives a lot of negative bias when, um, when things are written. They are nonetheless not understood as well as they meant from, from the one that, that was writing the comment. So 
And when I have a negative bias to my comment or to my review comment, it is not well received. So there is certainly the how I want to do my review. What the goal is, what we want to drive there, is really is a discussion. And this discussion that should be healthy. It should be um, a good back and forth and really facing on, on the technical side of um, what we are talking about. There are two parties involved. This is the author of the code and the reviewer. And the author, um, what he can do, his list is quite short to contribute to this discussion. He can receive this feedback. And this is maybe not that easy as it sounds, because if somebody is approaching you, this is totally not working, <laughs> what you build up. And then you immediately try to defend yourself why, why it is working, why this is a good approach. So, but maybe if you get some feedback, try to, to embrace it. Try to maybe think about it first before an Im immediate reaction. The reviewer is the one really driving, driving the discussion. Another example is generalize, generalize, generalizing. When somebody says, always use this or never do that, the author gets in a defense automatically. And when you talk in absolutes, um, the other one always thinks about exceptions to this rule. And then the author of the code only thinks now then uh, why this, what he did, is an exception to the rule you just, you just told him. And then the review is kind of over. So this is not a discussion, this is just a defending in, stand, in, in points. So another approach would be um, asking a question. Can you show me what you meant with this? And by asking the question, uh, the author feels trusted. He really, um, he really thinks, okay, yeah, um, he, he feels valuable what he did. So then um, there's no defense needed at all. And then it starts a conversation. When I ask him a question, it is already the start of the conversation. So this is kind of the way to go when you do a code review. Better to ask, not to tell. What do you think about moving a code block to a method? Or did you consider to check arguments uh, only in public methods and not in private ones? And when this is really not working well, then maybe, uh, can you clarify <laughs> what you did there? So even, even a harsh question is better, better than an absolute statement there. This is um, the conversation side. So this is what I learned. Um, it's also part of code reviews but there are also more practical approaches and more, more technical approaches to this. Some numbers for best practices on code reviews. These numbers are again from uh, Jason Cohen. Um, it was on a study with Cisco systems and the numbers are pretty high. I know they are high. Maybe if you are just um, reviewing code and tools, maybe just look at the diffs and there are only, I don't know, certain lines of codes. But if you're not, when you try to really have the whole context where the code lives or where the change was done, you need to review a lot more lines of code. And that was what they um, counted there in, in their study. So 400 lines of code is really a maximum. So we should not do more than, than 400 lines of code. And the most important thing there is you really go slow. It's like you, you shall not aim for covering a lot of code in your review. It's really the other way around. Focus on just some lines, the most important lines, and review them. And there's also a maximum time limit. It's, it is really 60 minutes because this is kind of how long we can concentrate on one topic. And a code review is, is very demanding of both the author and the reviewer. So really, after one hour, at least make a break. Maybe postpone the review and do it another time. And there's also another number, which I got from a, a talk from JetBrains. They say, okay, it's, it's good to have uh, multiple reviewers. Not everybody can afford to have multiple reviewers. But um, 
when you have the possibility, it is sufficient to have only two of them, because the first one finds about 100% of uh, the findings there are. The second one, um, only half of it, or half of it additional ones. So this is, um, and the third one after that, even less. So it's even much less. So it doesn't bring more value to have a third reviewer in, the, in this whole process. What is really important and what can also be driven by, um, by the author of the code is to have to provide understanding. Because only when I have good understanding, I can really benefit um, from, from the pros I can, uh, I can have when I conduct code reviews. So this chart um, kind of shows the level of understanding. The darker the color gets, the higher the level of understanding is needed. It is centered between um, low and high. This means um, everything that's more on the left needs less understanding than everything that's more kind of on the right. And that's it's the whole bar there. And on the what we see on the, um, on the left are the benefits we have. So when we start at the bottom, to avoid build breaks, I do not he have to have a lot of understanding of the context why I did the change at all. So everybody with a technical know-how can, can review this and can immediately spot if this is a build break or not. For this, we have certain tools, so this is maybe not needed at all. But we see um, kind of in the middle range when I see code improvement team assessment, this is also more on the left side. So I do not have to, to, to gain these benefits. I do not have to have a lot of understanding. But then when we go up higher, there's really a gap. So when I want to find alternative solutions or really, when I really want to find defects in my code, the level of understanding needs to be high. And this is really something I want to aim for as well. I want to have the best solution I possibly can provide for my code. So as an author, I can, I can really provide this understanding. And this is two things I need to tell the reviewer. First, the motivation of the change. Why did I change it? I need to provide the context, and this is kind of which requirement I wanna, would I wanna reach for this. And the second thing is your design approach. So this means really um, what did you thought or which way you were going down the route um, on implementing your solution. You can write this maybe in your commit message to keep it safe for history because when you need to revisit your changes, these things get often forgotten. It's just a proposal. Also, what's good to do is to do it lightweight. Do not have a big process. Do not make it too big for you guys in, in meetings and stuff because you can find uh, kind of the equal amount of, of findings or defects there um, with doing it just maybe over the fo folder or just at some time. And then reduce the human factor. As this can have very heated discussions, maybe if you use uh, tabs or spaces or something like this, um, then really just have like agreed on with your team on what use you want to, want to apply to your code and then have tools to just um, enforce these rules. And, that's, and then it gets on a neutral level. So the team server, um, um, the, the build server then tells um, what is wrong and what is not. And the tooling is good nowadays. It it's becomes better and better. But in the end, it's a culture. And it's not like a, a set of rules you can follow for your team. It's, it's just like, and that's what the learning when I did this research, it is something you need to decide for yourselves what works for your team and for your setup. Or if you do not have a team at all, um, maybe in your environment. And it is a culture thing. Um, it, is, it takes time. You need to start it at some point. And it will evolve over the time. So I emphasize you to foster a strong review culture just by starting, just by doing it without a process, just going there. And as we saw, emphasize the discussion. And with the discussion, really get the feedback. And with this feedback, we, um, 
we get to our long-term goal, more or less, and this is to become a better developer. Thanks. Any questions? We have time just for one question. Um, I don't see the problem with uh, reviewing uh, code that was written at home, like homework code. Uh -huh. well, what's the, the problem there? I, the I the problem was it. It, it wasn't reviewed at all for wow. our, for our um, because they were, we do not have a, a, a strong process there for getting the code into maybe your master branch. Okay. So if you're working on Git, maybe in your distributed team, you have a big process there. They have pull requests and certain people who can contribute, and we don't. Okay. And what the big, this is for us, and what the big companies have is really the problem of the remote Mac that you cannot exchange with each other very well. So the code, it really it gets pushed. It lies there. And until it gets to, to your master branch, it takes very long time. And this is too long for them. So... You want to be fast, and that's why they also decide to, um, to, to get the teams together, to really sit next to each other. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Remember to vote outside the door. Thank you, Sebastian.